Up next on The Way of the Renaissance Man, fighting the intellectual battles of our time with a rock star philosopher. Welcome to The Way of the Renaissance Man podcast. This is a show about ideas, personal empowerment, and celebrating the rational life. Our goal is to help each other discover the tools needed to better focus our minds, integrate our thoughts with actions, and live the lives we really want. I'm your host, Jim Woods. This episode, Jim speaks with philosopher Stephen Hicks. Dr. Hicks is a professor of philosophy at Rockford University and the executive director of the Center for Ethics and Entrepreneurship. He's also a senior scholar at the Atlas Society. Over the past year, Dr. Hicks has become a prominent public intellectual, appearing on many podcasts and television shows. His work on the subject of postmodernism and its application to today's cultural climate is just one of the many subjects that has vaulted him into the limelight. In this discussion, you'll discover the importance of understanding postmodernism as well as other pathological cultural movements. You'll also learn why both Jim and Dr. Hicks agree that the only solution to bad ideas are good ideas. The stakes are high, and the fight for a culture that respects individuals, freedom, and rationality is a deadly serious enterprise. Yet, listening to this conversation, you get the sense that these are two benevolent, life-loving warriors on a mission to promote reason. And now... Here's Jim's conversation with Dr. Stephen Hicks. So uh, today's episode of the Way of the Renaissance Man podcast, I'm honored and a little intimidated actually because this gentleman sitting next to me is uh, someone who knows well a lot more about philosophy than I do. And I look up to him quite a bit and he's, he's been all the rage lately. Mm. You're, you're a celebrity, man. What's mm. up? Stephen Hicks, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. Dr. Stephen Hicks. Uh, pleasure. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, uh, for the benefit of the audience, tell everyone kind of how, what you've been doing. And I see you everywhere. I see you on Glenn Beck. I see you on Debating Jordan Peterson. I see you uh, all kinds of like TV shows and stuff, you know. Yeah. You're like your you're intellectual rock star. Well, these days. thanks for that. It is, uh, it is fun. Uh, it's serious stuff. I've been a professional philosopher for a lot of years. I've written on uh, happy themes like entrepreneurship and uh, innovation and the progress that we've made since the Renaissance. But at the same time, we are in an intellectual and cultural uh, war. And it is war to the extent that it is spilling out into physical activism. Uh, and so some very dark uh, cultural themes are emerging and uh, also I've spent some time obviously in the intellectual world working on those themes so uh, as they have become culturally prominent uh, I'm in a position to have some things to say about those so straddling academic world and public intellectual world. Right I, I've noticed that your specialty things like uh, postmodernism, mm. like the work you've done in that is be people are trying to understand that now right because and partially it's the influence of jordan peterson sure. partially it's the influence of the kind of an intellectual dark web right. prominence yeah and but people are seeing it because they're seeing what's going on in the schools yes and they're seeing the the kind of byproduct of postmodernism. yes and they're looking at it and they're like this is crazy what is this yeah. why why if is you, this happening? Uh, if you track the google word trends where you can map what yours are hot and so forth there's a huge uptick starting in late 2013 and then significantly also in 2015. So already the culture is shifting significantly. There's reasons for that. Some themes that have been incubating strongly in the academic world are then spilling out into the culture. One indication of that is if you uh, do a subtrack and, and look at the New York Times word counts, all of the concepts of white privilege and racism and political correctness and all of that vocabulary strongly uptick. So there's a strategic shift at the New York Times, and that certainly is a cultural bellwether. Yes. And then in 2017, Jordan Peterson stands up and becomes the point man for, for fighting back. So uh, yes, I uh, am part of that trend that's coming out. And then intellectual dark web, and the fight culturally starts to push back at about that point. Yeah, now, I find it interesting, and I, and I find it beautiful, actually, that we have warriors on kind of our side of, the, mm. of this thing, your mm. side, my side, the yeah. same. 
because you can't fight bad ideas with anything but good ideas. Yeah. You know, they and the but the that side wants to kind of fight it in physical terms almost yes. and barring people and deplatforming people, right. getting sure. rid of people. But we need to actually step our game up and say, here's why this is wrong and here's what's destructive about it. Right. But we can't just say it's wrong and destructive. We've got to provide the intellectual underpinnings to why it's that yes, way. Absolutely. And that's where you come in. Sure. Now, you know, if it comes to uh, physical confrontations, self-defense certainly is, is an option. So we need to be prepared for self-defense. And history teaches us that lots of times bad ideas do become politically uh, enculturated. And when they come out of the left, uh, especially the left is not shy about resorting to terrorism and outright physical extermination. So that could be there, but it's always better to fight our battles in the intellectual realm, if at all possible. And that's where your point is exactly right. We, to a, to a large extent in the academic world over the course of the 20th century, lost a lot of key debates. And philosophy and the broader intellectual world went into a very skeptical moment about the power of reason, about the importance of individuality, about the possibility of a free society and its institutions working out peaceful, progressive solutions. And so uh, what you get then is a large number of people who say, well, if we don't need to be rational about this, if it's not possible to be rational about this, all we can do is fall back on our subjective preferences. And then it just becomes a free for all of subjective preferences. But if we have no cultural way of uh, saying we're going to be having discussions and arguments and seeing what the better arguments are, and that's how we're going to sort it out. Uh, the subjective preferences viewpoint says that's that's a non-starter. So all you can do is advocate your views by any tactics, and that will include physicalistic tactics. And so they got there first in the willingness to shut down debate, have one-sided presentations in the classroom, see education as a matter of indoctrination and training of activists. And of course, those activists go out into the streets and they will do the same thing. Fair or foul tactics, doesn't matter. Whatever works to advance your agenda. So yes, we are to some extent a few steps behind, but then as you also suggest, starting around 2015 or so, you start to see some people standing up, and Jordan Peterson is uh, the most prominent of the people who started to stand up at that point. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I one thing about, I mean, there's some things that I agree with with Dr. Peterson about, and there's other things that, that we would have points of disagreement. I'm sure that's the case with you well, as sure, well. Well, sure, he's trying to be a Renaissance man fitting into your theme, <laughs> right? So he has his academic specialties, and yes. he's excellent on those areas. At the same time, he's trying to put together an all-over synthesis to fight against the somewhat siloing and over-specialization. You know, someone needs to put together the packages yes. and say, this is what this means for your life and for society as well. Uh, and so therefore, you know, he's making pronouncements on all sorts of things and we will have disagreements with him on all sorts of things as well. Right. And it, th th those are healthy. And he's the type of person Absolutely, that you could yeah. talk to and kind of hash that thing out. Like, he's not afraid to talk to Absolutely. objectivists or right. le leftists or anybody else because he knows and you know, as I know, the only antidote to bad ideas are good ideas. Yes. And the only way to present your ideas is through a conversation, through reason, through argumentation. Yes. You can't persuade someone well, by physical your, force. Well, and through your independent commitment to looking at the facts and making those exactly. judgments. Exactly. But yes, other people, of course, are very useful as a corrective and uh, to point out things that you might not have thought of before. So yes, right. the social part is important. You, but, go ahead. Yo, yo, you've been doing that now in the public eye a lot more than most philosophers have. Mm, you know, true, I mean, yeah. Jordan has been like out there as a, as a kind of a, yeah. a spearhead, as you mentioned, but you've been doing a lot of TV and a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of stuff, shows like mine, things like that. Sure. Whereas you, before you were kind of cubby hold in the, in the intellectual kind of right. dark rooms, you know, yes. and which is, how do you feel about that? What, how does this feel, this whole thing feel? You're becoming a, a well-known name. Yeah. Well, Part of the reason why postmodernism and a lot of the pathological cultural movements uh, got traction was a kind of vacuum. Uh, what typically happens in the academic world, in the intellectual world, is people are specialists. They are really gung-ho about their particular thing and they only want to think about that. So what happened in the academic world was a lot of the postmoderns, using that term fairly broadly right now, uh, were then able to capture a large number of the institutions. And for a long time, people who were doing first-rate independent work they said, oh, those are crazy people, they're too far out there, I don't need to worry about them. So uh, a lot of us, so I would put myself in that group, 
uh, even though I was writing on postmodernism, just uh, ignored them. And that then led them to have positions of power within the academic world. But then at a certain point, uh, you start to see in the early 2000s and then picking up speed in the teens, some people saying, look, this is now dangerous enough. I can't just be a specialist. I also need to start confronting the pathological elements within the university. So I was a part of that trend. And uh, I was at that point actually working a lot more on entrepreneurship and things that I thought were a lot more healthy. But the postmodernism kept coming back. Uh, and so I then I had to say, okay, now I'll do a little postmodernism on that. Now, how I feel about it, uh, you know, I, I enjoy the travel. I enjoy talking with lots of different people from different perspectives. So it's, a, it's an enjoyable thing to do that. And since I think the stakes are high, we really are fighting for the culture. Are we going to have a culture uh, that respects individuals, that has a large space for tolerance, has a lot of freedom, uh, 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 in, in, uh, is in a position to continue supporting the institutions that have made it possible for us to become wealthy, long-lived, uh, and not have to worry about all sorts of things that killed and tormented people for much of human history. Those cultural institutions, we have taken them for granted, but they will go away if we don't attend to them. And they are under assault by the current generation of cultural warriors. So uh, in addition to enjoying the conversations, enjoying the travel, enjoying the exposure, uh, this is a deadly serious enterprise, so I, I, I do feel I'm well positioned to have part of the division of labor in that overall cultural battle. Yeah, you definitely are. I mean, you, you may, one thing I'm super impressed about on you, what, with you, I saw you on, on Glenn Beck's show, I saw mm. you on uh, mm. other shows, and the way you're making the argument is in such a well-reasoned, in such an ex like beautifully explanatory mm -hmm. way. Well, thank you. That you will thank you because yeah. what we all need is to know what the essence of these things are. Because we uh, we are as in our kind of philosophic uh, um, uh, kind of guru, not gurus, but our philosophic training, so to speak, <laughs> has been from uh, from people that revere reason mm. and pre people that respect facts and people that respect. The, the power of rational explanation. Right, absolutely. You know, and you do that beautifully. Well, a lot of philosophers do not do that beautifully. Mm. A lot of philosophers, particularly the postmodernists, because there is no reason in that kind of sure. thing. Yeah. You know, there was no lack of respect for it. But people think philosophy sometimes is just, oh, well, that's just the academic part. That doesn't have any real world mm. application. And it couldn't be further from the fruit, truth the most important subject is philosophy mm. because all else comes from that. Right. You know? Well, philosophy really is uh, every individual uh, being a human being. And part of being a human being is to think about what your life means, right? what it's going to be, what your top values are going to be, what your strategic plan uh, is going to be for achieving those. Because uh, unlike other animal species that can have values and, and, and so forth, we are self-reflective. We can think about the fact that our lifespans are, are short and that things aren't going to happen automatically. Of course, we have all of our day-to-day -day things that we want to get through, but our choices about what those day-to-day -day things are going to be, how they're going to add up to what I get accomplished this week, this month, this year, where I want to be by the time I get to the end of my life, what legacy I want to leave for the people I care about. All of that is the, the territory of philosophy. So it's inescapable as a, as a human being. Uh, but then philosopher's job professionally is to help people who don't have a time to read all of the books to, uh, to, uh, to, to do that more systematically. So in a way, what I'm doing on Glenn Beck shows and in my conversations with Jordan Peterson is the same thing I do in my classrooms. I talk with people who are interested and engaged about what's important. And my job really is to uh, make the case for thinking about this, thinking about that. And then when I have something to advocate, making the argument as well as I, as I possibly can. Yeah. I mean, you do that beautifully, like I said, and it's important because I, people get to put a face to ideas. Mm. You know, Jordan's become the most kind of well-known face of that. Um, 
but you're becoming that too. And I, I would obviously love for the world to realize that you know you're you're the real deal kind of thing, you know. And that's why I wanted you on the okay. show today. Well, because, thank you. Um, but but also well, there, there are lots of people who are the real deal out there in the academic that's world. That's true. So one of the encouraging signs, though, is we're starting to be aware of each other. There's networking going on. The social media thing is helping, Absolutely. and that's the yeah. thing. Like, that's right. it, I don't think any of this stuff would happen if there weren't podcasts, if there weren't YouTube channels, if there weren't social media things to right. spread these ideas. Now, yes. it's it can work f like for us, and of course it can work against us right. because a lot of bad ideas can get spread. That's right. By that, and and even the calls to action, like the the kind of leftist violence that we're seeing, and right. you know these kind of protests, sure. that stuff gets exacerbated by social media. Right. But the good ideas do as well, and it ultimately it comes down to you know. Whose ideas are better? Right. You know, who's, right. Who, how we can persuade them more. Right. Whose ideas are better, that will be the decider if we're enabled or allowed to have the debates on all of the social media yes. platforms. Yes. Now, right. It's a tool, and uh, uh, in the liberal understanding of how reason should work, we want them to be neutral platforms so that the best ideas do prevail. Uh, so, part of the distressing thing is, of course, the behind the scenes that's going on, and a lot of this. The, uh, the major platforms to de-platform and not to have the debate that's, uh, that's out there. Now, as a matter of politics, they should be perfectly free to de-platform anyone as long as they're upfront about we are coming from this perspective and we're only going to allow people of yeah, this perspective. It's a private enterprise, that's they can fine. do it, that's exactly. Fine. And those of us who, uh, you know, as long as they're clear about that, those of us who do get de-platformed should not complain. We should just up our game and say, all right, well, we'll make our own platforms. Have you have been the, a victim uh, of that? The freedom to do so. I would not say so. Uh, I know one of my, my documentaries on Nietzsche and the Nazis, which was on Netflix for, for a few years. We originally did it as a documentary and turned it into a book eventually. Uh, uh, and there the question is to what extent Nietzsche did or did not uh, influence the Nazis, because the Nazis all claimed Nietzsche as one of their own. To what extent were they correct or not to do so? And that was deplatformed at YouTube, and I don't know the reasons for that, whether it was ideological or just caught up in an algorithm. Or, what, what is or your not. thesis on that? Uh, split decision. I, uh, I do think that Nietzsche would have been horrified by some of the uses that the Nazis made of his ideas. Uh, but at the same time, the, the Nazis were not idiots. A lot of the intellectuals in the 1920s who were bestsellers, Martin Heidegger, Carl Schmitt, Muller Vandenbroek, Oswald Spengler, deeply Nietzschean, and uh, also at the same time, in varying degrees, gung-ho supporters of the Nazis. So I think in many respects, they were right to cite Nietzsche as part of the intellectual lineage of, uh, of the Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that's, you, you just, even a casual reading of Nietzsche would kind of give you that idea that, yes. uh, that this kind of the, the kind of that the should. demand. And also a deep reading. And it's not, I think, yes. accidental if we go to the postmoderns, that the intellectual genealogies get very mixed here. Most of the postmoderns come out of the left, the very far left, Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, Jean-Francois Lyotard, to a lesser extent, uh, uh, Richard Rorty on the American scene, but still far left on the American scene. And so they're, they're reading Marx and the fellow travelers there. But what is very interesting is, by the time we get to the second generation postmoderns, they're very comfortable with reading Martin Heidegger and Carl Schmitt and Friedrich Nietzsche. And typically on the old spectrum, those guys are placed on the far right of the spectrum. Yes. So what you find is, you know, there's a valorization of violence and rev revolution, the anti-reason, the anti-individualism at that level of abstraction. The far left and the far right agree. And so we are seeing yeah, to some extent different a forms of collectivism. Exactly. exactly. And anti-individualism and anti-reason and anti-enlightenment. So, mm -hmm. so those of us who stand for the enlightenment, for reason, for individualism, for freedom, we're fighting a twofold battle, but in some respects, uh, uh, the far right and the far left are merging in this generation. So, you know, the, the way it's often put, if you look at uh, Antifa, you know, the anti-fascists and the original fascists, you, you kind of have to look really hard to see the differences. <laughs> exactly. Intellectually, it's the, it's the same DNA. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's right. Well, the fight continues. Okay. And uh, you've been a great, great advocate. You've been an excellent warrior, and I, uh, I'm glad that. you decided to do the show right, today. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Stephen. Pleasure. Thank you.